Welcome to our second Rooster Booster um, for March. Missed you all a few weeks ago, but it's good to be back and good to see you all this morning. At this time, we're going to begin our program with our invocation and Pledge of Allegiance, so we'll ask that you please stand as we welcome to the podium from Casa of Ohio Valley, Rosemary Condor. Good morning. Let us pray. God of all, we come today with grateful hearts as we enter the new season of spring. We ask for your outpouring of the great wisdom, gifts of wisdom, understanding, compassion, love, and hope. Hope in today, full of promise, combined with the strong desire to do good and to be the example of you each of us are called to be. Hope for a community where each person is valued and respected, where each of us does the seemingly insignificant things that truly make a difference in profound ways. Hope in a community of fairness and equality and a place to be safe and secure. Hope for our, sm our small part of the world to be the spark to ignite a fire of determination, innovation, and resilience. We pray for your blessing for each of us gathered here today and for those who cannot be here due to illness, work and family responsibilities, or lack of resources. We ask for a special blessing for those most vulnerable here in our city and our county who know hunger, homelessness, disappointment, and loss of hope. Those who know the pain of abuse and neglect, the heartache of mental illness and substance abuse. Open our hearts to care and spread a message of hope. And we ask for protection and safe travel as our children and families prepare for spring break. And the chamber says, Amen. Amen. <laughs> Let's say the pledge, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You could actually remain uh, standing for this morning's Mingle Minute. Meet people, make friends, steal bacon. Yeah, we are Greenbow Chisholm strong too. Yeah, now it's Mingle. It is Mingle. Folks, thank you very much. Hopefully you met somebody new during the meal minute. <laughs> Right. So um, if you are joining us for the first time, you'll think this is fun. We um, Every Mingle Minute, we have a secret shaker in the crowd. And this morning's secret shaker is Megan Saulwester from the Messenger Inquirer. Megan, there she is in the back. All right, dear, who did you shake hands with this morning? Who'd you choose for us? Uh, Kaylee, from Kaylee from Hospice. Come on up here, my dear. Take the rather awkward walk from all the way in the back of the room to the front of the room. We'll just stare at you while you make your way. Um, 
Courtesy of Greenwald Chisholm, um, you are going to Bar Louie. Right. There you go. Thank you so much. Congratulations. At this time, we would like to welcome the folks who are tuning in this morning via radio on WOMI Owensboro. That is 99.1 FM, 1490 AM. Thank you for being with us. And we are going to take some time and recognize our brand new chamber members. And we have a few this morning excited about that. First up is Big Roots Lavender Farm, family owned and operated agritourism venture. Their mission is to offer products and experiences that contribute to the well-being of others. They have a product line, a store meeting space, labyrinth, you cut retreats, weddings, and more. They will also be at the Owensboro Farmers Market this summer. For more information, you can check out their website, Big rootsfarm.com. So please welcome Aaron Razy with Big Roots Lavender Farms. <laughs> she here? I didn't see her. I was told to the grapevine that she just got back from Hawaii yesterday. So welcome to the chamber. You discussed us. Um, <laughs> Burks Outlet is a part of Parent Company Bills Incorporated, a privately held company, rich in tradition and still owned uh, by the founding family. They were founded back in 1915, and they've grown over to 530 stores across the Sun Belt with online destination uh, destinations at BillsFlorida.com, BurksOutlet.com, and Benulu.com. Check out the brand new Owensboro location of Burks in Gateway Commons. Please welcome Michelle Crick, Melinda Grace with Burks Outlet. Oh, they're back, they're back. I was thinking you were in Hawaii, too. Um, IDK is the place to go when you just don't know. They are a clean buffet restaurant featuring made-from-scratch recipes, including home-cooked food, pizza, pasta, salad, soup, desserts, ice cream, and fresh peach cobbler daily. They also serve, uh, serve southern fried catfish on the weekends. Their chalkboard walls, Mr. IDK, Magic Tricks, Balloon Animals, are a favorite of the kiddos. IDK Restaurant is set to open May 1st and will be located on Highway 54, and it's going to be open seven days a week. So please welcome Tabitha Maiden and the team from IDK Restaurant. I command you to stand. Welcome, y'all. Can't wait to eat there, by the way. Play Smart Preschool is a play-based preschool for ages three to five that welcomes children with and without special needs. They believe that all children benefit from a peer model and developmentally appropriate learning through play. The philosophy of Play Smart Preschool is to educate and meet the needs of the whole child, social, emotional, and academic. The preschool opened in August of 2018 and is based out of Simply Therapy, who also provides weekly group speech and occupational therapy. So please welcome Trina Pryor and Jill Payne with Play Smart Preschool. They have the mayor all to themselves this morning. Reynolds and Associates is a team of professionals who specialize in real estate transactions, appraisal and consulting services, and education for real estate professionals. Reynolds and Associates was founded in 2013 and is owned by Brian S. Reynolds. They provide a variety of services related to the real estate market. Whether you are a real property appraiser seeking to develop your skills, comply with regulations, and minimize liability, or if you're commercial or a residential buyer or seller, their team can assist you. Please welcome Brian Reynolds, Justin Reitmeyer, Rebecca Pate, and Krista Hardesty with Reynolds and Associates. <laughs> Justin Kelly Clarkson tomorrow night in Nashville. It's happening. Uh, Rising Lotus Incorporated is a 501c3 educational nonprofit organization and a registered yoga alliance school. Their mission is to make yoga, meditation, movement, ergonomics available to all by maintaining partnerships with socially responsible individuals, nonprofits, and businesses. Rising Lotus Incorporated offers partial scholarships to students that demonstrate a financial need. In accepting the scholarship, the student will complete an internship at a business or a nonprofit organization. They offer regularly scheduled classes and workshops. So please welcome Philip Bibb and Susan Walter with Rising Lotus. <laughs> and
And WKU Owensboro alumni is a group of Western Kentucky University alumni living in the Davis County area, participating in social and charitable events, keeping alumni connected to WKU in fun and exciting ways to support the spirit of the WKU tradition. They have raised enough money to sponsor two scholarships, and they continue to search for opportunities to fund these at both the Bowling Green and Owensboro campus. Work with the National WKU Alumni Association to meet the mission of the organization. Uh, new members are welcome, by the way, and go Tops. Uh, please welcome Claude Bacon, Deb Philman, Rob Jones, and the WKU Owensboro Alumni Chapter. At this time, we would like to recognize our uh, special guests, our elected officials who are with us today. Um, so please, rounds of applause for Mayor Tom Watson. Mayor Pro Tem Larry Maglinger is here too. City Commissioner Pam Smith-Wright. City Commissioner Larry Condor. Uh, we also have County Commissioner George Wathen. Sheriff Keith Keynes back there in the back as always. County Attorney Claude Porter is here as well. And from the Owensboro Public School Board, we have Dan Griffith and Jeremy Edge. Round of applause for all those folks. Again, apologies, folks, if I missed you, I apologize. We always scan and try to get everybody. If we missed you, our apologies. Um, also, want to give a big shout out to a local racing Hall of Famer who is with us today, Army Armstrong's right over there. <laughs> And a very special and warm welcome to students from the Owensboro Day Treatment Program who are with us today. A big round of applause for those folks. Thank you all for being with us. We are, typically this time we uh, recognize an ambassador of the month. Not this month, we're going to recognize three. Because these folks absolutely careered it in handing out membership packets for the year. Uh, we actually have... Um, three prizes to award this morning and uh, getting the third place prize um, from 323 Staffing Solutions, Wes Roberts. Give him a round of applause. $50 at Buffalo Wild Wings and there may or may not be a game tomorrow night at like 9-10. Yeah. <laughs> uh, getting our second prize this morning from BB&T, let's hear it for Jared Darty. who's won a $50 gift card to Jay's Liquors. And I know Jared, and he will use this. <laughs> okay. Oh, you're accepting on his behalf? Thank you. Of course you are. <laughs> uh, and our, our first uh, prize goes to, I think she handed out about 90 membership packets, which is incredible. Um, from Disaster Team, make some noise for Amber Farmer. You have a $50 gift card to the Red Door Salon and Boutique. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. Thank you, One more round of applause for all those ambassadors. <laughs> My goodness, what a milestone anniversary celebration we have this morning. My great honor to introduce our breakfast sponsor from Greenwell Chisholm, Carl Greenwell. <laughs> Thank you all and good morning. good morning. I want to thank you all for being here today to help us celebrate our 100 year anniversary and to hear from CASA also. Candace has given me the impossible task of condensing 100 years into five to 10 minutes. I'll be leaving a lot out, I assure you, but let's get started. It all started with my great uncle, Emmett Greenwell and Paul Chisholm, 
who formed the company in 1919, just a few short months after the end of World War I. They opened at 232 Frederica Street in what had been a saloon and part of the Planters Hotel. Bar Louie holds that location today. By the way, our first phone number only had three digits, 266, so I chose you how old we are. 37 years later, in 1957, we moved to 211 West 9th Street and built a 5,000-square-foot facility. 38 years after that, in 1994, we again moved, this time building a 10,000-square-foot facility at our current location of 420 East Parish. The story of six green wells and five others is in a booklet that you'll find in your take-home bag today. Uh, I wouldn't bore you with just telling you about Greenwell Chisholm. It's also 100 years of Owensboro and 100 years of things going on in the United States during the same period. I think you'll find it an interesting read. But the real story is about all of you all in this room. A few years ago, Jason Hayden, who works at the Museum of Fine Arts, and by the way, used to work for us, was in our office looking for some old photographs to display at an opening that we were helping to put on. During that visit, I was showing him some uh, printing samples from back in the 20s and the 30s and the 40s. It dawned on both of us at that time that we had become a library of history for many of Owensboro's companies. As I said, our business then, as it does now, exists because of all of you and other businesses in our community. We would not be here today without the many loyal customers that support us. We have many long-standing customers of 30, 40, even 50 years. Companies such as Modern Welding, EM Ford, Owensboro Health, Brescia University, Diocese of Owensboro, City of Owensboro, Don Moore, Owensboro Grain, and Domtar, to name just a few. Some people say that printing is dying. There is some truth to that. Some 20 years ago, there were 30,000 commercial printers in the United States. Just 10 years ago, that was down to 20,000. Today, it stands, stands at around 18,000, and best guess is it will bottom out at around 15,000. Most shops that are closing have five or fewer employees. Printing is not going away, it is going somewhere. There have been so many changes in new technology in the printing industry in the last 25 years, it is just astonishing. Our success has come due to keeping up with the advances and investing heavily in new technology. Just 10 years ago, we invested over a million dollars in a new six-color Heidelberg press, the largest press of its kind within 120 miles. An actual life-size sample of the press is out there on the wall. I don't know how you could have missed it coming in, but if you did, it will be on your left as you exit the room today. <laughs> I forgot to turn my page, folks. <laughs> Being larger does not mean that you're safe from closure. Krieger Ragsdale and Keller Crescent, two large printing companies over in Evansville that were much larger than Greenwich Chisholm, closed because they had concentrated a majority of their work in the pharmaceutical field. When that industry left Evansville, it put both those companies in hard times, and they subsequently closed. We have become the largest printer in the area, including Evansville. We currently have a total of 34 employees, with two offices in Owensboro and one in Evansville. I feel one of the main reasons for our continued growth is our diversity and clientele. We are strong in banking, healthcare, education, industrial manufacturing, nonprofits such as CASA, <coughs> excuse me, and many religious organizations and institutions. We have become proficient in all of these fields. When bad times come, rarely do all, does it affect all of these industries at the same time. I must say, 2008 to 2011 was very hard on us. I can only imagine how my great uncle and my grandfather weathered the Great Depression. We at GC are strong because of institutions like the Chamber of Commerce, who not only support us, but support all in this room to make Owensboro better and stronger than in the past. I've done some research, and GC is not alone in reaching this century mark. 
There are over 20 other companies in our area that have reached the position of 100 or plus years. I read recently the difference between people getting old versus growing old. I thought that was the same thing. <laughs> Not so by this book I was reading. Getting old lets aging happen to you. Growing old means growing into your evolving life of aging. Embracing that and making the best of what you have. I feel the same thing applies to companies. By growing and embracing the changes that come along, we become better and we change when and where we can. Our company over the last 20 years has gotten into mailing and fulfillment. Our promotional division has produced all the things you'll be taking home in your goodie bags today, including the bag. <laughs> and our wide format division has produced all of the banners, wall murals, floor graphics, and signage that you see here today. And that is still just a small part of what that division can do. Candace, not sure how I'm doing on time, but I'm almost finished. Okay. It's your stage. At this time, I would like to acknowledge all of our current and previous employees. If you all would please stand so that we can recognize you. <laughs> Folks, these are the ones that actually get your jobs done. It isn't me. <laughs> One of those that stood was Ozzy Mattmanger, right, right here in front. Ozzy actually worked at our original plant back on Frederica Street back in the 40s and still comes by our office a couple of times a year to visit and to get some hand stamps, I think is the last thing you got. <laughs> but, uh, I had two of those that stood, but it was only one of those that stood with us today, Tommy Greenwell, my cousin. Uh, who is semi-retired and still works a couple of days a week with us. He's the gentleman, by the way, that was in that uh, original uh, video that you all saw. I think that press may have been one of the original presses that <laughs> came back from the 20s. Tony Trigo, who had planned to be here today, uh, left our company over a year ago. Tony uh, has another vi business that he's heavily vested in, and he's pursuing that uh, full, full steam ahead. I uh, would ask that you keep uh, he and uh, his family in your prayers. His sister-in-law is dying. Uh, they plan to be here today, but they're making other, other arrangements right now. So the story of six Greenwells and three generations is poised to become the seventh Greenwell and the fourth generation with my son, Brian. Brian and his wife, Lauren, moved back to Owensboro over two years ago with their family after being in Minneapolis and Louisville, Kentucky for over 10 years. Brian joins the company as vice president. Uh, we had plans to announce, with no one else knowing about it, about a 15,000 square foot expansion at our parish location this year or next. The Messier and Inquirer helped us out with that announcement a month or two ago, and that's fine. <laughs> Advertisement is advertisement, so. <laughs> and finally, I give tribute to my wife, Molly, who I've been married to for 43 years. She is my rock and my heart behind the scenes. Never a day goes by that she doesn't ask how things are going at work. Neither of us knew when we got married that one day I would also be married to a company with 34 others and families I would be feeding. By the grace of God, my home, and my GC family, I live a blessed life. I absolutely love what I do. Thank you, and God bless. Uh, before we get to our chamber update for the month, we do have a very special presentation. I'm presenting that Mayor Tom Watson. Good morning. Good morning. It's a good place to be, isn't it? One guy you left out, I got to recognize. I know you don't care about the police because you're always running from them, but we are. <laughs> Our 
Kentucky. Well, how, how do you say that? The chief of the state or something now? You did some award. What was that, Chief? <laughs> He's like the, what, what was that award? Chief of the year. <laughs> Humble Art Elam. Well, I have a proclamation I'd like to read for you. Uh, actually, it's for Graham. He, I don't guess he's here right now, but uh, he's my little buddy from church. So, <laughs> the city of Orangeboro, whereas Greenville Chisholm Printing Company in Orangeboro, Kentucky, celebrates 100-year anniversary, and whereas in their 100 years of business, Greenville Chisholm has grown from a company that printed only on paper to a company that can print a logo on virtually anything you can imagine. Whereas Greenville Chisholm is currently run by third and fourth generation Greenwells, Carl Greenwell, President, and Brian Greenwell, Vice President, and whereas Greenville Chisholm committed to quality and customer service, commitment to quality and crap, I'm old. I'm getting old and I am old, so let me get start again. Sorry, Carl. Whereas Greenville Chisholm's commitment to quality and customer service is the same now as it was when they opened their doors in 1919. Whereas we proudly recognize and celebrate Greenville Chisholm 100th anniversary in Orangeboro. Now, therefore, I, Thomas Hart Watson, Mayor of the City of Orangeboro, do hereby proclaim March the 28th, 2019, as Greenville Chisholm Day. In Orangeboro, I encourage all citizens to join me in congratulating the owners, employees, and loyal customers that have helped Greenville Chisholm reach this momentous milestone. Sealed and signed this 28th day of March, 2019. I don't know if y'all printed those, but it looks good anyway. <laughs> and now on behalf of uh, Representative Suzanne Miles, I really got to have my glasses for this one. Uh, the House of Representatives of the Commonwealth of Kentucky, 2019 regular session, House Resolution number 194, Wednesday, March 13th, 2019. Representative Suzanne Miles introduced the following resolution, which was ordered and printed. A resolution honoring 100th anniversary of Greenville Chisholm Printing Company, whereas for a century Greenville Chisholm Printing Company has been an instrumental part of the business community in Orangeboro and Kentucky, whereas Greenville Chisholm was founded in 1919 by Emma Greenville and Paul Chisholm, and whereas the interviewing, whereas in the next years the pre the business has grown to include the man is script, um, <laughs> promotions and mailings and fulfillment and wide formal divisions. And whereas today, Carl Greenwell is the sole owner and his son, Brian, is the company's vice president. And whereas Greenwell Chisholm recently announced a $1.2 million expansion, which will add necessary square footage to the company headquarters and lead to the hiring of new employees. And whereas the honorable the body congratulates the shareholders, executives, and employees of Greenville Chisholm Printing Company upon the organization's 100th anniversary and grants everyone involved with the business very best wishes as they continue to serve Orangeboro with the excellence the customers have come to expect. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the House of Representatives of the General Assembly of the Commonwealth of Kentucky, Section 1, the members of the House of Representatives hereby honor Greenville Chisholm Printing Company upon the occasion of its 100th anniversary. Section 2, when the House of Representatives adjourns this day, it does in honor of Greenville Chisholm Printing Company. Section 3, the clerk of the House of Representatives is directed to transmit a copy of this resolution to Representative Suzanne Miles for delivery. Suzanne's a lot prettier than me, but I'm delivering it in her place. Congratulations, <laughs> Carl. At this time, we are going to have our chamber update, and with that, our president and CEO, Candace Brake. All right, I'm coming. <laughs> you got it? Good morning, everyone. It's so great to be here today. Um, just to want to make a comment about Greenwell Chisholm, and particularly Carl. There is not a more positive person um, that I know of. He is always there to... Uh, 
to uh, be encouraging and has been a great friend to, to us and to me on the staff. He'll stop in and say hello. And there's always uh, something good to say. And even if there's a suggestion, it's done in such a positive way and an encouraging way. So he makes us better at what we do. So Carl, thank you so much for all that you've done for me throughout my career. And thank you for what you've done for our community. And Brian, we can't wait to work with you more through the years. Thanks. We have a ribbon cutting at lunch today at 1215 at Bank of England Mortgage and then Feta Specialty, which is under new ownership with Shay McWhorter. We're going to have their ribbon cutting on Friday, April the 12th. So that ought to be fun and a great way to kick off that weekend. The legislative recap. At the end of this session, we decided to have a recap with all of our legislators, and they are all confirmed. All of our local legislators are confirmed. They'll be there Thursday, April the 18th, at the chamber on the third floor in the Commerce Center, and all of our members are welcome to attend. We will take questions, and um, they will provide us with recaps of what happened in the last session and maybe some previews of what's to come in uh, the coming months. Our Chamber Works Expo is April the 25th. Last year, we had over 500 people there. Uh, we sold out very quickly on the booths, and we're, we're getting very close to full capacity. That's sponsored by the Owensboro Convention Center, and they have great food. There's great drinks, just great atmosphere for everybody to get together and to celebrate the depth of our Chamber membership in the Owensboro business community and nonprofit community. CYP has a very busy month and a half. Uh, networking lunch is April the 10th. CYP self-defense class brought to you by Brad Youngman and Jared Ramsey will be April 10th as well. CYP Girls Inc. panel will be at the chamber on 415 uh, on April the 16th where we get to talk to Girls uh, Inc. about um, executive uh, life as women and just uh, leadership in the community. And then CYP happy hour is April the 18th. I guess that's legislative recap day. We're going to end up with a happy hour. Good call, CYP. That'll be at 515 at CYO. The network is meeting Wednesday, April the 3rd at 8 at Old Hickory Barbecue. And the Chamber Matters are at your place. Take some time to look through those. Uh, we have our renewals there. And as we say every month, and I, I know I might sound like a broken record, but it's so important for us to realize that the people that are our Chamber members are stepping up and saying, it's important to me what happens in this community. Please do business with those members, and if you have a question about someone you're doing business with, all you have to do is go on owensboro.com slash chamber. We have a member directory there, or you can call us. We make around almost 2,000 referrals a year directly from the phone. So give us a call, and we'll let you know the people that you're doing business with are chamber members. The United States Census is next year, and this time we've done a kickoff. There's a committee called the Complete Count Committee, and Judge Mattingly made a resolution creating this committee, and their goal is to get our community, because we know we're above 100,000, and that's really an important piece for us to be able to access not just federal funds, but to say we're over 100,000. The Complete Count Committee is here today. Would you all please stand in the back with the sheriff? He's watching over, making sure they get the complete count. <laughs> And more to come on that throughout the year. It's actually going to be kicked off next March, so you'll be hearing a lot from us over the next year. That's going to be a really important thing for Greater Owensboro. John Conti, thank you for the coffee this morning. I didn't bring my John Top uh, Conti mug. Kind of need a new one, so, you know, just saying. We need some merch at the staff level. <laughs> and I want to close today at our annual celebration. We recognize excellence throughout our membership. And today we'd like to recognize the Nonprofit of the Year Award. They really did, don't even need an introduction for the work that they do in the community, but we do have a video that I'd like to play, and then afterwards I'm going to ask Puzzle Pieces to stand and the staff and the, the volunteers that are here to stand up and be recognized. Uh, your work in our community, um, Amanda and staff and board, you touch us all. And Amanda, I wrote a note to you yesterday to tell you that about 40 years from now, we're going to be telling stories about when you started this because it's truly an Owensboro legacy. And we are so proud to be a part of watching you grow this and watch where you go next. You make us better. Casa of Ohio Valley, Crossroads Inc., Daniel Patino Shelter, Hospice of Western Kentucky, Owensboro Symphony Orchestra, Puzzle Pieces, St. Joseph's Peace Mission for Children, Western Kentucky Botanical Garden. The organization is just something that has a servant's heart. Uh, they, they found a need in the community that was there and present that needed to be addressed. It's kind of shown how you can emerge quickly, um, swiftly, and how you're able to take 
one opportunity and turn it into a thousand opportunities. I think they are very unique in the way that they work and what they do and what they provide. The organization is top notch and it's not a Monday through Friday, nine to five business. It's something that finds the need and addresses it no matter the time or day, 365, seven days a week. And as a parent, I feel my child is safe um, and being cared for very well. And that's that ease of mind that we all want for our future and our children, especially those with disabilities, like my daughter's nonverbal um, and can't speak up for herself. But I think that she's being heard. And just seeing the importance of what they're doing every single day and how much heart they have behind it and how consistently the staff works so unbelievably hard, how driven they are to making sure that they're providing the best experience that they can is just overwhelming. I don't know where I would be or where Owensboro would be without Puzzle Pieces. Well, from Kentucky Legend, I definitely want to say congratulations to Puzzle Pieces and Amanda Owen and your fabulous team for everything that you have done in the last year. Congratulations, Puzzle Pieces. Puzzle Pieces is very deserving of this award. Um, and we congratulate you from the bottom of our hearts as a parent um, for what you are doing and where you will go in the future. Congratulations, Puzzle Pieces, on receiving this well-deserved award here in 2019. We wish you the best. Keep up what you're doing, and the community stands behind you 110% from here on out. <laughs> and they got a new van this week. <laughs> <laughs> which was awesome. Um, at this time, we would like to present our most valuable recruiter award. And Mayor Watson didn't realize he was stealing a little bit of our, thund our thunder this morning. Uh, the honors and recognition of outstanding efforts in creating an uh, economic impact for Owensboro Davis County. So at this time, we would like to recognize Chief Art Elam. <laughs> who's receiving this award today for his efforts to bring the Kentucky Association of Chiefs of Police to Owensboro this summer. It's awesome. Uh, by the way, the conference is going to create a huge economic impact right here in the community. Um, and so congratulations. Thank you so much. And uh, we need your help. If you belong to a state association, uh, please connect with the CVB and let us bring your group uh, to Owensboro Davis County. And of course, thank you, Chief Elam. Uh, if you want more information about their event, you can uh, see the chief or Lieutenant Powell for information about that. Um, at this time, um, we are going to introduce our featured speaker today. Very pleased to have him with us. And to make that introduction, our board chair, Dave Roberts. Well, good morning. Beautiful day out there. I'm getting, uh, I was just thinking, sitting up here, you know, uh, someone touched on, I think Rosemary touched on spring break uh, coming up next week. And a lot of folks are heading out of town or getting some downtime and then middle of March Madness. We've got teams still playing, so what an exciting time. I do want to give a shout out to the back row Joes, my old buddies back there. You know, I always thought they didn't pay attention to what was going on up here, but by the looks of my phone, uh, they're commenting about everything that's going on up here, so, uh, uh, so it's great. Um, also, Carl, uh, Candy touched on this, but I've had the privilege of working with Carl on uh, some nonprofit boards and just a, a number of things in this community. So we saw what Greenwell Chisholm is as a business, but maybe what we didn't see quite as much of is what they mean to this community and, and the work they put in and, 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 and how vested they are. So congratulations to you guys on this. You know, we celebrated 20 years at my place last year. You're celebrating 100 years this year. Um, what an impact you made over this last 100 years and it, proud to call you my friend. So Brian, look forward to your leadership as we come, on, uh, come forward here. Uh, I'm very excited uh, to intro introduce our, our guest this morning. Um, he touches on and, and really focuses on a topic that I think it's near and dear to many of our hearts. I know for me, um, I've got daughters that are school age. Uh, I've got a wife that teaches uh, elementary school and um, the needs uh, of children uh, and, and families in, in our community are, are, are there. 
um, I was really encouraged. Uh, he gave a, a, a brief bit of positive information. He said, you know, Dave, he said, I've been in this community a few times. He said, I was here the last couple days. And he said, um, this community, along with Las Cruces, New Mexico, probably the most progressive uh, that he's been around as it relates to the issues he's going to speak to you about today. So what an encouraging uh, note that is. And I think uh, his message will resonate with all of us. Um, Without further ado, I'll introduce this gentleman. Uh, Dominic Capello is a New York Times bestselling author, Oprah Winfrey guest, and co-author of groundbreaking book, Anna, age eight, which I have sitting in front of me there. I'm gonna read it uh, on uh, spring break, actually, Dominic. Thanks for the reading material. Uh, he advocates for the public and private sector to collaborate, working at 100% in order to prevent the national epidemic of childhood, student, and family trauma. Dominic is the co-founder of Safety Plus Success Communities, a socially engaged strategic planning nonprofit collective specializing in continuous quality improvement. He leads quality improvement for leaders in complex agencies like the Child Welfare Systems of New York City, State of Connecticut, and State of New Mexico. He worked for the New Mexico Department of Health Epidemiology and Response Division and the New Mexico Protective Services Research Assessment and Data Bureau. Dominic was the curator of Santa Fe's first public TEDx conference showcasing solutions to social challenges in New Mexico. He has a Master of Arts in Liberal Studies with an emphasis in language and communication from Regis University. Dominic is also the creator of the 10 Talks book series on family safety that gained a national audience when he appeared on the Oprah Winfrey Show. Please join me in giving a warm Owensboro Rooster Booster welcome to Mr. Dominic Capello. In our book, An Agent, we discuss how safe families produce successful students and thriving communities. Unfortunately, across our towns and cities, family households are not places where all children are safe. Instead, children endure adverse childhood experiences, or ACEs. There are 10 ACEs that include physical and emotional neglect, physical, emotional, and sexual abuse, and living in households where adults misuse substances, have mental health challenges, are violent to partners, parents are separated, or a family member is incarcerated. Addressing ACEs provides an incredible opportunity to redesign our towns and cities into communities that are not only family friendly, but thrive economically. For those city leaders eager to generate more prosperity, we have the technology at hand. But what defines a family friendly city? When we say family friendly, we mean a village, town, or urban center where it's easy to start a family and raise a healthy child. Be a teen who explores the wonders of the world and is safe from all the less than healthy temptations. And benefit from an economically thriving home base with jobs and support for small businesses and entrepreneurs. To get there, we must first recognize that what we need from our family-friendly cities has changed. With our mobile devices, we don't need a physical space to bank, send packages, get a degree, or complete government forms. We can order almost everything we want online. So traditional main streets and big malls have lost their purpose and make us wonder if we really need public spaces anyway. But in our communities, we still seek human interaction. We may not need traditional physical services, but we still crave face-to-face -face contact and a connection to the community around our homes. To achieve this, we need to rethink how our cities serve parents and children. We need sidewalks for strollers, safe routes to schools, shuttles that can take baby carriages, systems that allow easy online enrollment for early childhood learning programs, and our family-friendly schools need on-site wellness centers to make engaging with medical, mental, or dental care easy for both student and parent. To keep our teens safe and healthy, we need bike paths and free shuttles to allow students to safely and easily reach activity centers where teens want to hang out, complete with sports, maker spaces, and educational activities to fill every evening and weekend. We then provide a clear path to a positive, productive future as teens grow into adulthood. In our family-friendly city, business owners, farmers, and artists work together to organize youth to help with community projects and introduce teens to apprenticeships with mentors of all types. 
To make a city's economic engine hum, city leaders and business people come together to identify each region's asset. All right, hello, uh, it's great to be here. Uh, I come from New Mexico and there are probably two incredibly important questions that we need to answer in my, in my talk. The first one, um, the people of Owensboro want to know, why is Dominic Capello here from New Mexico at a rooster booster? And the people of Santa Fe want to know, what is a rooster booster? <laughs> I can answer the first question. Uh, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about uh, a hidden epidemic that impacts every person in this room and every business in this room. And um, it's an epidemic of childhood trauma. And it's important for the business community to hear what I have to say because I think that we in the uh, public sector have not done a good job of reaching out to you. I think in many ways when you hear childhood trauma, you think, well, child welfare takes care of that. Maybe public health takes care of that. Maybe our education system is handling that. But how often have you as business people been approached and told about this epidemic and what this epidemic means to business? People who experience childhood trauma and people, and I mean children who experience childhood trauma, um, are put at real disadvantage. And there is a connection between experiencing trauma and experiencing emotional pain, which leads to substance misuse and abuse and emotional health challenges. So I want to be clear about this to the business community. The connection, the connecting the dots between our kids who are really vulnerable, who experience trauma and go on to not be productive workers. These are the workers who call in sick. These are the workers who may show up and not be able to do their job. These are, these are the people who may be 25% of your community who seem lost and need special services that cost us a lot more than, we, than, than maybe we need to be, be spending if indeed we could prevent trauma in the first place. So again, it's about the bottom line. And so I'd like to share with you just a little bit about what you as the business community can do um, as people who think um, strategically and who understand the importance of getting to results. So the first thing I'd like to say is that we have some good news. We live in a nation that in many ways is very, very divided. And I, we could have a long conversation about that, but it's great to find something that we all agree on. Everyone agrees, and this is 100%. You can't find an adult who would disagree. We all agree that all kids should be safe. That's great news, right? Is there anyone, is there any adult who would like to not agree with that? Please raise your hand. We don't want to put you on the spot, you know. Uh, oh, I thought, I thought you were raising your head. No, he's just scratching his head, people. Don't, don't kick this guy out. Uh, so this is good news. I travel across the country, and I can't find a single person who disagrees with me. We wrote the book, Anna, age eight, with my colleague, Dr. Catherine Ortega-Courtney. You know, our background was in child welfare and public health. And it's so great that everyone agrees, but there's a, there's a little problem, is that we may say that we want all our children to be safe, but are we doing what's needed to make every child safe? So the book, Anna, age eight, starts with a story about Anna, eight-year-old Anna. It's a, it's a long story, and because we, lived at, we were in the research department of child welfare, we, we understood all the details. But the, the, the quick, sad story is Anna, uh, there, were tr there, was a, there was trouble with Anna and her mother, serious trouble. So Child Protective Services came. That's what Child Protective Services does, right? They saw there was a problem. They pulled Anna out. Good news, right? Anna's now safe. And investigations went on, and they determined that it was okay to send Anna back. So Anna went back to her mother. But then there was another problem. So they had to pull Anna out. 
Then Anna went back. This went on eight times. Finally, on the last time, this won't surprise you, but when Anna went back, her mother kicked her to death. This can't surprise anyone in the room. As business people, eight times back and forth, as business people, you must be thinking, how could this happen, right? I mean, records are kept. There's a, there, there, all, there are reports being made. Wouldn't you say, after the third time pulling a child because she's not safe, that that's enough? Something went very, very wrong in this situation. Now, this is, a, this is an extreme case. Most children are not becoming fatalities, but there's a lot going on under the surface that we don't know. And as we wrote our book, we thought our book would just be about child abuse and the child welfare system. But as we started writing, we started learning much more about adverse childhood experiences or ACEs. And this is a term you will be hearing more and more and more. Um, there was a study done 20 years ago looking at adults. They came up, researchers came up with 10 questions about your childhood. What did you experience? Was there abuse? Was there neglect? Was there hunger? Were you living with people um, with, with challenges? And so we learned a lot about what happens to us as children when we experience these things. And um, the study is, is probably the most important public health study you've never read and probably never heard of, but it's important to read. And in our book, we discuss the study. Um, so the study um, and the survey, it's called the ACEs survey, 10 questions that have been given out to adults and to children for 20 years. Um, it asks you about physical and emotional neglect, physical, emotional, and sexual abuse. It asks, were you living with adults who misuse substances? Um, are you living with uh, household members who have mental health challenges? Are you witnessing domestic violence? Um, are parents divorced? Are household members incarcerated? So these are the 10 questions that we have been asking adults about their own childhood, but we are now asking students. And there was a state senator in New Mexico who read the book a year ago, and he uh, uh, said, well, I'm also a teacher. I teach high school. I teach high school psychology advanced placement, as a matter of fact. I'm gonna ask my students. I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna give them the survey. And um, I just wanna know, I really wanna know. Um, so he did, he gave it to a class of 30, and then he gave it to another class of 30. He had, of course, called, made, you know, was in touch with the administration, he was in touch with counselors to make sure if there were any problems. This was done anonymously, and what he found in both classes in Las Cruces, New Mexico, was that three quarters of the students have three or more ACEs. So imagine you're a high school teacher and three quarters of your students are living with various forms of abuse and neglect. And we wonder why they don't get their homework done. These are not kids, these are kids that are Having, having to decide, do I, do I think about my homework or am I going to ponder if I'm going to be safe when I go home? So this is what we are living with. Now, we in New Mexico and in Owensboro don't yet know the level. We have done, there have been surveys of the adults asking them about their childhoods. And so we've learned about the level but we haven't gone um, to our students to ask, how is it for you? And it's time we ask, because students won't be learning, and they won't become the employees you need, and they won't become the entrepreneurs this community needs. So there's a lot that we need to do. So as I've said, in some classroom, two thirds, in other classrooms, one third, but you're not going to find a classroom where children are not experiencing ACEs. So this is something the public sector and the private sector have to finally, after 20 years since the study say, it's time we look at this, and it's time we end this.
There is no reason that any of our children have to be experiencing this. And there's no reason why any of our parents have to live with the untreated trauma. And you can well imagine that if we don't talk about this, what we get is a cycle of abuse, right? The child is abused, traumatized, becomes the parent, and the cycle starts up again. I'm not suggesting that for those of us who do have an ACEs score, and I have an ACEs score of five, which I found surprising. My co-author had an ACEs score of zero, which I also found surprising. I'm not suggesting, and the authors of the study are not saying, because you have an ACEs score, this is how your future unfolds, but it does say you're at risk and you need to pay attention. So in the book, which is available online, and I hope you all, I hope you all, I hope you all will read it, um, we talk a lot about why this society we're in has not yet really made the commitment to end childhood trauma. Um, smiling students hide trauma. We could all go to a school right now and see a lot of smiling kids because kids who are traumatized are not going to tell you if, unless it's anonymous on a survey, but they're not in general, not going to tell you. Um, growing up in my family, the last thing I wanted anyone to know was what was happening when I went home. You feel a lot of shame. You feel a lot of anger. You feel a lot of sadness, but you just don't want people to know, but it's time that we ask. And, um, if we don't do this work, if the private sector and the public sector don't come together and do this work, then the trauma continues. So then the question to you is a really hard question. And I asked this across the United States, and I think this is our toughest question. What percentage of our students do we want to write off? In Owensboro, you could tell me, do we want to, if we, don't, if we do nothing, I can tell you right now, we're writing off a quarter of them. A quarter of our students will have untreated trauma and will slide into substance misuse. The cycle continues and just, they won't be the best kind of employees we need. And they won't be the kinds of people that we want to create a, an empowered and resilient and family friendly city. So we have to decide, do we write off 25%? Do we write off 50%? Do we do, a, do, we do some work and then we only write off 10%? Do we write off 2% at a, at a summit sponsored by Spark, I asked the, the, the public sector how many we should write off. And they said, they of course said, we, can, we shouldn't be writing off any students. So this is the work we need to do. Um, I, I would like to reframe all of this, by the way, because I'm a very optimistic guy. And um, I wanna know what percentage of our students get to thrive. And I'd like to go for 100% there. I think that we have the capacity to get there um, how do we get there? How does Owensboro get there? And I, I should mention I have two pilot sites. One's in Owensboro, Kentucky, and one's in Las Cruces, New Mexico. And there's been interesting work happening here that you don't know about, but soon will, and work in New Mexico. Um, but we have to think about designing our cities and our counties to get to 100%. And when I say what getting to 100%, I mean that we need people to be innovators and entrepreneurs because when it comes to behavioral health care in Owensboro and in your county, do 100% of our most vulnerable people have access to behavioral health care? Or just 75% have access? Do 50% have access? Do 25% have access? We have done the survey and we can tell you. So that's the good news. We have the data. So. Do 100% of our most vulnerable populations, but really all of our populations, have access to medical and dental care? Safe and stable housing, are we, too, are we at 100%? But this is where the business community plays such an important role. Don't ask health educators how we're, gonna, how we're going to um, be incredibly innovative and bring in new types of housing, green housing, um, manufactured housing that can be done right here in your county. I mean, there's all kinds of things happening where there's such innovation that we could make, we could create the kind of housing, and this could be a startup. I mean, 
I think the business community could do amazing work here that would help everybody. Um, how do we get food systems working? You know, Starbucks um, already has a software system working with nonprofits where all the food they don't use is now tracked right to food banks. So in Seattle, Washington, they've got it down, but that's private sector thinking. So this is where we need you. Transportation. Have you ever heard of a little company called Uber? I love Uber. I think Uberization is really interesting. Like imagine life, by the way, I was from New York City before I moved to New Mexico, so I've been car free for 34 years. Shocking news to most of you. But uh, Uber, Uber changed my life. I used to have to wait in Santa Fe and get a taxi two hours before a meeting because they may not show up and I had to have a fallback to get to a meeting. Um, Uber, three minutes. So life before Uber was really hard, but little software, little outside the box thinking, and some, some guy, I think he made a few dollars off that project, by the way, um, but this is the thinking we need. How do we Uberize these services? And I'm not suggesting suddenly everything's gonna be done on computer and on the web. People do need face-to-face, -face, but so much of what they need is on this little device. So that's where your thinking is so important. So as you think about these different sectors, think about, well, what could I bring to that? You know, I have an idea. I have an idea for a company that could actually meet that need. Not only do I help people, not only do I end trauma, but I, I start a really vibrant business. I think the opportunity here is incredible. Um, and I think it's what we as business people should be doing to be socially engaged. I think we should be able to make, to make a wonderful living, and I think we should make the living of everyone positive. So think about family-centered schools. We have to rethink our public schools. They can't just be the way they've been for 100 years, a box with 30 kids and one, one person standing in front with 75% of the kids or even 5% of the kids in trauma. We can do so much better than that with technology, with data and collaboration early childhood learning programs. So much of this can go online and vibrant, vibrant videos and um, um, using all kinds of apps. I think we have incredible opportunities with youth mentorship. Um, if we can't have big brothers, big sisters here for whatever reason, um, we can have virtual mentors coming in and we could support your current mentoring programs too. So again, I think that this topic could be framed as either preventing childhood trauma, or creating family-friendly cities. And I think it's the family-friendly city theme is where we want to go. We want to get to 100% in 10 areas. So again, when I talk about childhood trauma, people go, oh, Dom, that's just too big. We just, we can't take that on. That says, no, you're touching on too much. I go, it's not that much. It's 10 sectors, 10 services that need to be improved. And a lot of it will be improved with your outside the box thinking. So that's what we need. And again, when you think about trauma, when you think about families that are struggling, and I should mention, ACEs exists in all households, all socioeconomic levels. This is not something that's happening on the other side of town. This is happening everywhere. And it's important to understand that. It's just that for those with few resources, adding to that trauma just sets them back so far. So we have, have an opportunity here to think about how do we make sure that all of our parents have jobs, can get training, um, in addition to all the other services they need. So in conclusion, what I'd like to challenge you and me and New Mexico and the nation with, how do we use data? How do we use technology? And how do we use collaboration to solve this problem? I believe that we can get to 100%. You know, when I talk about 100%, I love 100%. I mean, I, I mean, when you think about it, it's like, well, again, how many kids do we want to leave behind? Is 1%, I mean, 1% is not even okay, right? I know this is a bold idea. I know this may sound like a moonshot, like, wow, what, you know, what are you saying? What I'm saying is, let's just use our creativity, our common sense, our compassion, and our courage 
to make sure that we're not going to leave any child here or any vulnerable parent here behind. Will this happen tomorrow? No, it won't. But can we come together? Can we form action teams? Can we form new companies that will actually address this and make Owensboro the safest place to raise a family? I believe the answer is yes. I believe you in this room are the change agents that are going to make this happen in collaboration with our elected leaders. So we have an incredible opportunity to get not, not to 30%, not to 70%, not to even 99% when it comes to our kids and our, and our vulnerable parents. 100% can be our goal. And we, we can put that out there. It can be five years, it can be 10 years. But if we don't have the vision of 100%, we're not gonna get anywhere, right? If we don't think about it, if we don't commit to it, so what I'm asking you to do is, to, is a homework assignment. And this homework assignment should be pretty easy. If what I've said to you resonates, there are two things I'd like you to do. There's a book called Anna Age 8. And I think this book, it's a 2.5 hour read. We've timed it. 2.5 hours. It's available online for free at AnnaAge8.org. And this book, is changing people's lives. Um, I should tell you that, uh, well, I'm gonna give you a second part of the homework and then I'm just gonna conclude with a really wonderful success story. Um, after you've read the book, I want you to reach out to Spark. Spark is here. Rosemary Condor and her colleagues are, are have, have an entity that can take your questions, your ideas, your energy, and we can turn, we can turn your ideas into solutions. So your homework assignment, read the book, contact Spark. And for those of you who might be sitting here thinking, well, I, you know, yes, of course, you know, trauma is bad and 100% sounds good, but could we ever do that? Is that possible? I mean, how, how do we even begin? So I come from New Mexico and let me tell you, um, New Mexico, there, there's, a, there's a survey called the uh, Kids Count by the Annie E. Casey Foundation, and they rate every state every year um, in terms of which is the safest state to be a child. New Mexico won 50th place. So we're last. We're at we're we're bottom last. And we've been we've been at 48, 49 for decades. And so you would think a state like this is the last place that would embrace a book like this. But the state senator who did that survey was so mortified by what he learned and so touched because the student said to him, do the adults know what's happening to us? And if they do, why aren't they doing anything? That's what our students are saying when asked. So the senator said, you know, Dom, you and Catherine, this book, this book, you've got, you've got the blueprint here, you know, but you, we, gotta, we, we need more than a book. You know, you need a technical assistance center. You, we, need to build, we need to build a thing that's gonna take these ideas and we need to be in the state capital and then we need to, we need to support all 33 counties in getting to 100%. So I think, I think you need to build the Anna Age 8 Institute. And I'm like, what? He goes, no, you really need this. He goes, as a matter of fact, why don't I get the funding for you? And I'm like, what? So he marches right over to his counterpart, who is uh, uh, both sides of the political aisle, by the way, bipartisan support. They create a bill, and he went through two months of what we call the session with his 112 lawmakers and governor. And I'm happy to announce, and this is the first public announcement of this, that he got the funding for us to launch the Anna Age 8 Institute July 1st. So, so this is the power. This is the power of having a vision, finding colleagues, and making amazing things happen. And this is what I, we, we look forward to supporting Owensboro and all of Kentucky, and we will support you in any way you want. We will be in working in collaboration with Spark, and I wanna thank you for having me here. Thank you very much.
Folks, thank you so much for being with us this morning. Thank you for everything that you do for the community and for being local business leaders. And if you are headed out on spring break, have a wonderful time. Have a safe time. If you are going to be staying in town for spring break, you can join me and toilet papering the houses of everybody who's leaving for spring break. We'll see you in May. Thank you so much.